Hi there. Hey. How's We're it back. Going? <laughs> we are back. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully you enjoyed We're that. We're having too much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so hopefully you enjoyed seeing Kathy talk about monitoring, and uh, we still got a few more sessions coming up. But we had a little bit of a break, so we were going to sit here and talk about a few things. Yeah, well, we've been talking about a few things. Exactly. So uh, for those of you in the U.S., it's, it hasn't been a big change this year, but here in the EU, we had GDPR take effect a few weeks ago. Yeah, although i got to say, I think it probably affects more people in the U.S. than they believe it affects. Maybe. So, <laughs> so what do you think of the GDPR? Now that we've, we've, we've been doing this for months, getting months ready. Months and months. Right? Yeah, oh, my God. Um, what do I think about the GDPR? God, what a waste of time. No, I'm kidding. Um, what do I think about the GDPR? I think it's actually really interesting. Um, I have a cynical point of view, which I won't share now. Um, but I think it's actually really interesting what they've done, the way they've done it. Um, the focus on the individual, I think, is the more interesting aspect to me. Because rather than try to define exactly uh, what makes information, it's like, look, there's a person. Right. We know what you know. We know what that is. Right. Um, don't mess up their data. Which that you know. I mean, that's. I mean, in a nutshell, that's really kind of what it's all about. Right. So I mean, like right. As an individual, I appreciate that. Yeah. Right. Like I think it's oh, yeah. huge. I don't like my data yeah, being no, randomly no. put out there. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, every time I go to a Troy Hunt site, have I been you know pwned? I'm like, I hate if there's another item that yeah. appears under my email. You know. So I'm glad from that perspective. From the business side. It's a little bit of a pain. It's, you know, I've, the one thing I would say about the GDPR that I found going through it over and over again, working with our, with, working with our organization, working with PASS organization, um, doing some, you know, little bits of consulting on the side and talking to a lot of other people, the best thing about the GDPR is, is it's telling us to do the things we should have been doing already. Right. And it's, it's, we, which is what you want to do, right? Yeah. So it was interesting. We had our summit uh, in London last month, and I was over here with that. And, and I ran a panel, and Simon Sabin was one of our guests on the panel. Right? Sure. He, he's a friend of ours. He owns a consulting company over here. Yeah, yeah. And his point was, really, this is the kind of stuff we should be doing all along just to make our businesses run smooth. Right? Sure. To understand where our data is, understand what data we have, keep control of it. Yeah, manage our data appropriately. Right. I mean, heck, if nothing else, it can it cut down your costs on your disks. It'll cut down costs on processing. I mean... Exactly, right? We don't, you know, we don't have people randomly copying databases or extracting data and then using out-of-date data, right, because they put it in Excel or some other crazy situation. So his view was that it, it forced us to be a little more mature sure. as data professionals. Right. right? And so he saw it as a, a fantastic way of uh, just just smoothing out the way that we deal with things rather than the chaotic, hey, just give me... Right, yeah, yeah, just make it happen. Just restore this database <laughs> here and there. So uh, it's interesting, you know, so I don't know how you feel. If you've ever been to a client, right, or you've, I know you've worked at many companies. Sure. You've seen people, developers, they restore a copy of the database because they're trying to look at something or fix something, right? You right, oh, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. God that, knows, right? yeah, I did. So how many copies do you keep around then when you do that? Yeah, way too many. Too many? <laughs> yeah, way too many. I went to a client. You know, and, and it's easy to lose track. It you, is. Know, you, you throw it up there for something you needed, and you turn, you blink, you know, object permanence, it's gone. <laughs> what do you mean? keep around? I went to one of our clients, a Redgate client in New York. Well, and, I mean, it's gone from here. Yeah. I mean, they, it's, it's still on the... They were restoring databases for these different functions. They were trying to, you know, fix a bug, do an enhancement or something. And this one guy had... I think like 18 copies of his database, like in, in on an instance, and every time they were dated, like I forget what it was called, but you know, production uh. underscore <laughs> January 5th, yeah, yeah, 2010, yeah. production underscore February 9th, uh. and they were like, "Why do you have all these?" On, like on well, his highly, on his I was, highly secure. I was server, working yeah. on this thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then something came up, so I made another copy so I could do something else, and I was like, "Wow, that's crazy." Yeah. Oh yeah. But that's the kind of stuff people do, and then they don't pay attention to. Uh, the risk of having all those copies of stuff around. Yeah, no right? kidding. Well, I mean, so. it's like I talked earlier in the, in the keynote about uh, Uber having, a, yeah. having a, the production data in, in a non-production environment, and people got into the non-production environment, and bam, they had production data. And that's happening more and more. Right? That was you know, my talk as well, and there's, I see that more and more that maybe every third or fourth breach is test and development system, sure. not production system. Yeah. So in, in line with oh. GDPR, right, <laughs> I'm sure many of you out there, and I know you have as well, and I have gotten tons of emails to opt I'm back still in. Still getting them. You're still getting them. <laughs> I actually got one last week too, where somebody sent me a note and said, "We'd like you to opt in if you still want to get this." 
And then they sent me a reminder at the end of the week that said, all right, we're going to delete you. But if you really want to, you can click here. Right. So what do you think about that? As a well, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting thing because what if I'm in a situation where I have signed up to a place six years ago right. and they've kept my data. Right. So they know that on June 5th, uh, what would that be, 2012? Math yeah, is yeah. hard. Uh, June 5th, 2012. June 20th, actually. But well, I know, okay. but I'm making up a date. <laughs> so I signed up to their event or, or to their program or to whatever it is, and they, they know that I signed in. They know that I went through some sort of opt-in. You know, do you want to receive emails? Yes, I do. Right. So per the GDPR, what do I now have to do? Oh, well, I have to opt in again. Well, no. No. No, they've got, they've got a very clear record that I opt in, opted in. Right. Now, all they have to do really is publish the information that we process data, and what we do is we send out emails to people who have opted in. We have a record of who's opted in, who's opted out. I mean, we know, we know everything we need to know to make this happen, and we're done. Right. Yeah, I mean, we didn't do opt-ins at SQL Server Central because... You know, for those of you that signed up to get our emails, you consented. You know, whether that was, you know, last week or last month or you know, 15 years ago. So we don't. Our guidance is you don't need to have you opt in again. And I think that's true for most businesses. Sure. Right. Unless you're changing what you did, or you yeah. bought emails or something. Oh yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Especially if you bought emails. I mean, if you've got unknown stuff then pe people are going to ask to be forgotten and or you better get them opted in because, right. yeah, you are absolutely right. flying by the seat of your pants at that point. I mean, I think the key is, right, you have to disclose what you're doing with data and you have, then you have to be responsive to requests. So if, uh, you know, if they've spelled your name wrong or right. they've got the birth date, then they have to correct that. Um, but there's one other thing. So in line with that, there's this right to be forgotten, which always gets DBAs, I think, acting a little funny <laughs> about how do we deal with the right to be forgotten? <laughs> Deletes, they're easy, man. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting, right? Because mechanically, there's a bunch of things to worry about, right? Because I may have integrity in multiple places, right? Sure. I've got oh, yeah. customer and orders and order lines and products and all this stuff. I don't want to, I can't delete the customer. I shouldn't be able to delete the customer necessarily, right? Because well, I mean, from a legal standpoint, if you've got data that you have to keep around, you can't delete that customer. Right. So, but even, even if, so there's, there's this precedence, right? So if I, we, we sell something, typically we're bound for seven or 10 years, depending on what jurisdiction. Yeah, by UK law. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not like we're, we've decided seven years. No, no, no. Right. We're, we're yeah, required so legally to. Most of the tax authorities, I think, are seven years. I think it's seven in the US as well. And then, um, I think some countries have 10 years, but it's that's the highest precedent. So you know, if you say I want to be forgotten, we're not deleting that stuff for 10 years or seven years because yeah, yeah. the tax authority is important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The tax man's coming. <laughs> but even yeah, it, even if it was seven years old, right? Say I had an order from Amazon that was more than seven years old, and I said I want to delete that, um, they may not be able to delete that record because they'd have to delete shipping and a, potentially a bunch of stuff. Right. What yeah. they could potentially do is just tokenize that. Right. right. So it's you know it's not me any longer, but it's some random string. And in fact, thinking about it from a from a data standpoint, you know, data science and all that kind of stuff, you're not going to want to delete your data. Right. You're going to want to mask it, um, hide it, you know, munge it in some way that's unmungeable. Um, right. Right. So just like we might do in test and dev environments, I want to either anonymize it or de-identify the particular item, sure. right? So it doesn't matter if it were to say, you know, um, if you change me to a GUID or change it to just, you know, SJ5000, as long as, you know, my birth date or my address or my email. Additional information that makes it personally identified. Right. As long as you got rid of that or change that as well, then right. you're fine. So what about backups? Though? What do we do with backups? Oh, it's easy. You just have to restore every single one of them, including all the logs, and modify each of those things and, and, then, then, back and then back them up, them up again. Yeah. It's easy. We've got a product to help you do that. No, right? no, we're kidding. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I mean, backups is hard, but there's precedence. Right. And it's, um, it's legal precedence. And the, and the legal precedence is the actual legal profession. Um, I've, I was talking to some people because uh, I've been putting together a lot of stuff going, gosh, I'm, I think this is how it works, but I don't know. Right. I mean, because, again, the GDPR, we haven't seen, you know, the enforcement started, but we haven't seen case law establishing everything yet. And until we do... Some of what we're saying is speculation. Right. But um, in legal circles, there is already a right to be forgotten. Um, they can, you know, if you, if you get completely expunged from the legal system, yeah, we arrested you, fingerprinted you, 
took you into jail for a week, but eh, gosh, turns out you are completely innocent. Right. Um, they will remove your records. But if they've already got that in a backup, what do they do? Yeah. Well, it's a tricky situation, right? So if, if you use good database design, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And you have either a surrogate key of somewhat or a, a non identifiable non identifiable key, we could just keep the use keep a record of the keys to delete. Sure. Right? And on restore then we delete those keys. Because we were talking about this with SQL backup and how would we implement an automated process. And it's at the time I make the backup, I may know some people to be deleted. Sure. But I don't know everybody because no. as soon as I make that backup, there'll be people that come along and say, I need to delete stuff right? Right. across years or whatever. And when I do the restore, uh, I have to catch all <laughs> right people. But, that's, but in the legal profession, that's what they do today is they, they, they track you know, using you know, a GUID or an identifier or some yeah. completely non-personal method of keying the data. They, they keep track of the keys of what has to be deleted. Yeah. And they run the restore and then they clean out the, the deleted data based on dates, right? which is actually kind of cool because you like you say, well, this restores from a week ago. There's been five deletes. I don't need to run 50,000. Right. I run five. Yeah, so the hard part, though, is what if you have used email as the key, right? There's plenty of systems yeah. that think use email as the key. Yeah, so yeah. Now, social security number. Right, or... social security number, tax ID. So then I've got to keep a record of those IDs somewhere, though I think it's not necessarily super horrible because I haven't I don't have necessarily linked that to anything else. Right, right. but I mean it's, it's technically a tough place, yeah, right? I mean that's that's if you're in that situation you might you might be needing to talk to your lawyer. Exactly. Um, <laughs> or, we, may, we may not have all that information. Or you gotta change your database design or you gotta think about doing things differently that I could use IDs or surrogate keys or GUIDs. Or maybe throw a GUID on the table, you know on, on the on the main table so that you've got a different way to do that. Yeah, you've yeah. got an, an additional uh, constraint or something that so that, so that brings us to, get that to another story. Right? If if I've got to start modifying things, we're doing a lot of work in database DevOps. Sure, you know, Redgate spend a ton of time, brain power, effort. We're serious research. About it. We're really trying to make things better. So, and in, in, as all your experience, right, working with customers, clients, Redgate, what do you think's a way to start doing this or get better at the DevOps thing, right, for databases? Start. 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 Starts. <laughs> well, I mean, starts the big one. I mean. It, it, because, I mean, uh, there's a lot of moving parts. Yeah, there is, it, right? It's as much as we've made it as simple as humanly possible, it's still not simple. No, it's not. You know, and we've made, we made some changes this week. We, went, we released SQL change automation. Yep, and, yep, and, yep. Um, which I, I, just, well, I just installed it and tested it. It's working. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> which I like, but it's not the simplest, easiest, smoothest thing to get started. Um, but, you know, getting started can be a challenge, right? Like, I've got work I'm doing right now. I've got projects. I've got that Sure. Time. How do I how the, do you get somebody to, to just find time or get it moving? Yeah, finding time, that I can't help you with. Yeah. You've got you to make time, okay? But uh, how do you get it moving is, um, to me, is, is you, you really do. You have to start. Pick one project, um, get it into source control. You know, make sure that you can get it in and out of source control. Once you've got it in and out of source control, then... Start automating the build. See if you can, you know, see if you can check it into source control and make the build occur. You know, I mean, I always the way I teach it. Um, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll show everybody. Here's the 30 steps that you need to do this thing. Right. But it's about eating the elephant. You know, you're not going to sit down and do all 30 steps. You do step one, get that working. Do step two, get that working. Do step three, get that working. Once you get to the point where you've got one or two tests, like one or two minor little tests, you'll start to see benefit. Yeah. And then it'll build out faster. So, I mean, I agree. Like, I've tried this in a couple ways with clients. One is don't take an existing project because um, you already have enough stress with just getting that going. <laughs> yeah. right? um, use a proof of concept of some sort, something small, sure. right? So, I've had a few customers, I say, create a new database with one table in it and try to make that build and try to make that deploy to some other system sure. right? because it's practice. Now, you're kind of doing double work because I have to have time for my proof of concept as well as my other work. Right. But I, I've got to do that anyways a little bit to learn, right? Because I certainly could take an existing project and do that. And all I would do there is say, do what you normally do, but then add the ability to get the version control. Right. right? Even if you're not using it, right, just kind of add that. And then when you find more time, add the CI piece, right? Sure. But Slowly. It, it, it's no different from query tuning, though. I mean, it's, you know, okay, so I've got this query and I've done things to it. 
And I have and to now deploy it, right? And now it's, it's, yeah, it's got to go. go, but it's running slow. What do I do? Right. Well, it, same thing. You've got to, you've got to you attack gotta you know, little bits and pieces and yeah. figure out what's wrong. Well, it's the same thing with, with uh, DevOps stuff. It's, it's little be bits and pieces to figure out you know, what to make things smoother. Yeah, there's, I mean, because there's no magic here, right? I, and people often ask with DevOps things like, can it just automatically deploy to six servers, or can it avoid locking the table when we add a not no column and have to fill in data or something else? But uh, it, it can. It's but just, it can, it's, right? But there's a lot of work involved to make it so it can. Well, but it, but it's not DevOps that does it, right? Because no, no. There's rules to how no, no, we make no, no. changes yeah. in SQL Server or Oracle or any platform. We're bound by those rules. Right, right, right. The physical right. universe interferes with us in a big way. So, so the way Microsoft allows us to make schema changes or deploy uh, updates to a system, we, there's no magical way to get around that. No. All we're trying to do with DevOps is kind of automate the stuff that you would figure out. So right. that when, when you make the next table change or something, it's the same way and it's smooth. Well, and document the process so that, so that we're communicating. So that, so that um, I mean, because I always, I always argue DevOps is about communication. It's not about... You know, it's kind of weird to hear a tool person say this, but it's not about tooling. The tooling makes it easier. The tooling, oh my God, the tooling makes it ridiculously easier. But, but it's about the process. Right. It's about the communication. It's about the, the mechanisms of ensuring that, you know, that we, we know what we're deploying and how. Right. I, I would completely agree with that. I think the biggest challenge with DevOps is just becoming a better developer because uh, a lot of these things yeah. that, you know, Redgate makes really easy and, you know, Team City and Octopus make really easy is stuff I've been doing for decades. Uh, it's easier with these tools, but the, the process is the same. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. We built, um, my old company, we built a full-on CI, CD process by hand. Right. And I've done that, too. We did it. I mean, we did it. It worked. It was a push-button deployment all the way through. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. really horribly hard. Horribly hard. But it, but it was about the process, not the automation. The aut automation was a ton of work. Right. But, but the process was, was the important part. Right. And nowadays, you would, the process oh. would be the same. You just use different tools, right? You yeah. Use you use Redgate tools. You'd use some oh, of the other yeah. CI, CD stuff that's out there. Oh, yeah, man. A little bit of team services, some, some GitHub, and the, yeah. and the Redgate tools. And we are off and running. God, that'd be great. And so, one, <laughs> so of the things, one of the things we've done, uh, we've built a maturity assessment. So sure. on our website, we've actually got a kind of a maturity assessment tool that you can go through. And so under our database DevOps section, um, there's this maturity assessment option. And if you scroll down, you can kind of go through some of these and answer some questions. If I just, I'll just do a couple while well, we have Grant here. Um, so this first one is about monitoring, and it's kind of a, a scale of how mature are you in monitoring? Do I do nothing at all? Or do I have some type of you know, completely automated tooling that's checking and alerting and letting me know what's going on? And so you can pick, pick whichever one you want and then continue on to the next question. And so we've done a lot of research. Uh, right. you know, different groups here have done a lot of research oh, with yeah. customers. We've partnered with some companies that do research for a living. That's their business. And so we've, we've tried to aggregate all of the information and knowledge we have and let you assess where you stand compared to other companies. Right? We're, we're basing a lot of this on data. We were, hey, it's kind of weird. Data professionals using data to make decisions. Exactly. It's kind of cool. Exactly. And so you can go through these different areas. You know, in this, the protection area, it's, it's monitoring, it's backups, it's those, those items you want to do to protect your systems. And so, you know, as you go through, if you say that I haven't done something, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter to us, right? But it, it helps you figure out what's the most mature or the less mature thing you've done. So if I just kind of randomly go through this, let's see where we stand. If we pick some areas good and some areas bad. Not really reading these. So. Right. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Congratulations. You're yeah. intermediate level. So, so, we're intermediate. so we've got a mix. And so you can you can kind of see where you stand in these different areas. And we have it for the various parts of development and DevOps as well as kind of this is a little more on the operation side than the development side. But and, and as as with so many other Redgate tools, this will give you some guidance, it'll give you some help. Um, and it'll lead you on to, to make things a little easier. Yeah, so go ahead and take the maturity assessments and see where you stand and uh, you know, see if you're great or were bad or something, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so next up, I think we have a short break, and then uh, the amazing Tom Austin is going to talk about uh, SQL change automation. Is that what you're doing, Tom? Yeah, so, so oh. stick around and watch uh, what we've done that's new at Redgate. It's pretty. All right, we'll see you in a bit.